Today, we'll see two heats of round three of the 1992 Australian Touring Car Championship from Simmons Plains in Tasmania. On the same bill is two heats of round two of the Shell Oil Superbike Series with Seven's fantastic race cam in full effect. Young blokes Craig Lowndes and Stephen Richards take part in the second round of the Formula Ford Driver to Europe series. While Mark Scaife continues his winning ways in round two of the Tui's Gold Star Australian Drivers' Championship. You can see all this on Super 100 MPH. Sunday, March 15, 1992, was Glenn Seaton's day. It was his only win for the year in the Sierra RS500. And by Bathurst in October, Seaton was already in the EB Falcon, going on to take out the 1993 championship in that car. Here's a clip from an interview we did with Glenn at Eastern Creek. Part of the hero stories that we do on our channel is you are one of them. And, and, and you joined the young age with guys like Alan Grice, those sort of blokes. How, how was that in those days? I suppose when you look back on it, it, it was unbelievable because um, it was, a, 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 I suppose, a sport built around older guys, the Brocks, the Johnsons, the Grices and that, and there was very few young guys coming through and having opportunities. I got a great opportunity with Fred Gibson with the Nissan race team that put me in a position to be able to be the next young generation to come through and then followed by Scapey which Fred gave him his opportunity as well so I suppose I look back on it now and it probably changed a bit of the history of, this, history of it because it was built around older guys and, and probably I was myself and Scafie were sort of the earlier younger ones that have changed into what it is today where it's all about young guys because they start go-karts at very young ages now at seven and by the time they get the opportunity to, to run in the main game in, um, in supercars now, they've done so much racing over their history of uh, right up until right, like most of them are 20 and 21 that are, that are real stars in that game now. So they've done a lot of racing up till then already. So, no, it's, it's, it was a great honour to be able to compete against those sort of guys because they are the icons of the sport uh, from the past and, and have done a has lifted our sport to what it is today. Um, they've started that original history and to be one of the young guys that come through to, to help part of that and also to, I suppose, make, other, make race teams look at younger guys when I got involved and, and the success I had and, and Mark had um, has really changed the direction of the sport. So let's go straight to Seven's coverage of round three of the 1992 Australian Touring Car Championship from Simmons Plains in Tasmania. Your hosts are Mike Raymond and Alan Moffat. It was a day spectators will remember for quite a while as fenders touched and paint was traded in the great Sandown shootout. Round two of the Shell Touring Car Nationals was very much the John Bow show as the hard-charging Tasmania draw to successive wins after taking provisional pole in the Swift Sierra. Consistency also paid off for Nissan duo Mark Scaife and Jim Richards who still topped the series leaderboard. Seven Sport welcomes you to Simmons Plains, Tasmania, battleground for today's third round of the Shell Australian Touring Car title. Once again, the Superbikes are here to weave their own brand of magic. Scott Doohan leads the Shell Oil Series from resident rev head Mal Campbell, but Kawasaki's Matt Maladden remains the boy to beat. That's all to come in our two-hour special of handlebars and touring cars from Simmons Plains. Proudly brought to you by Shell. Good afternoon Australia, I'm Mike Raymond. Welcome to Simmons Plains and round three of the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship and also round two of the Shell Oil Series for Superbikes. Well, as we said earlier, Mark Scaife and Jim Richards topped the leaderboard in their Nissan GTRs. But so much of the last couple of days here at Simmons Plains has been taken up and the headlines dominated by Ford Sierras. And Alan Moffat, I guess that brings a smile to your face. Yes, it does, Mike. There's five Sierras in the top six this morning. The lone GTR this time is the GIO car. 
and uh, for some strange reason, uh, Freddie Gibson's win Winfield's just cars were just... Are they foxing? That's what everyone's asking. Well, I hope they're not foxing. I hope they're saving their tires, because that can only be the only explanation available. Well, when we left Simmons Plains last night, John Bow had pole position. Of course, the Peter Jackson Dash opens proceedings on a Sunday morning, and unfortunately, John Bow pulled position number and six. Here we are with the start. Glenn Seaton pulled number one out of the bag, and he led early from Dick Johnson. Then we saw Johnson streak around the outside, having a little contact, a little bodywork hanging off the car there, but he was still able to outdistance himself. It was a fantastic drive from Dick Johnson and gave him the opportunity, of course, to sit on pole position today. But if I guess one driver is disappointed, it's John Bow who has been the fastest man in three touring car rounds, but will start not off pole today. And with John, it's Andy Raymond. Well, John Bow, quickest again in pre-qualifying, but you're not starting off position number one. Well, that's the rules for everybody. If you're in the top six, you draw for position, and I, for my normal run of luck, I drew six, but I've just managed to get back up to third, so it's a 50% it's a, a step, isn't it? And pole position, in fact, teammate Dick Johnson, you must be very happy with that, Dick. Well, certainly after the start, because I had, uh, I had my left foot on the brake and it was in second gear, and then the thing all of a sudden got all its horsepower at once, and I thought it was going to do a right turn in the fence there for a minute, but we sort of gathered it up, and I got a bit of a hit up the, the backside down the other end there, which uh, sort of really didn't upset us that much. But So, Dick Johnson on pole position, and John Bow, the man that's been fastest for three rounds, starts out of the second row. We've got the cars coming out onto the track now, and to take a look at the grid, it's good afternoon to Mark Osler. Thanks, Mike. Dick Johnson on pole position after his win in the three-lap dash. Glenn Seaton alongside him on the front row. Out of position three, 18, John Bow on the Shell Sierra. From four, Mark Gibbs in the GIO Nissan. And out of position five, Wayne Park in the second Peter Jackson Sierra. Out of position six, number eight, Colin Bond. But Bondy hasn't made it to the grid yet. We'll see if he starts. Position seven, Peter Brock. And uh, position eight, Mark Scaife in the first of the Winfield Nissans. Position nine, Neil Crompton in the Mobile One Commodore. And rounding out the ten, Tony Longhurst in the little BMW M3. And a fantastic crowd here today at Simmons Plains, Tasmania. Probably a record for the circuit for touring cars since they switched to uh, Group A back in 1985. We have all the ingredients of a fabulous first heat here today. Conditions are ideal. The Sierra's off the front row. Watch Johnson and Glenn Seaton. Off the start. Has Seaton won it? He sure has. He gets away quickly, but John Bow in the number 18 car picks up a gear and comes up smartly as they come up to the first corner. And Mark Gibbs on the outside, that is not the lie to the first turn. He's going to get caught very wide here, but he goes in deep, and he'll get plenty of acceleration off that four-wheel drive car as he comes off the bend. You'll see that on our next camera shot as John uh, Bow tries to get to the outside of Dick Johnson. He's a little quicker than Gibbs coming down the back straight, but it's Glenn Seaton who will lead them down through the curve. Johnson right on his tail, then comes John Bow, and they've dropped off the Nissan as they come down to the left-hander at Coca-Cola. Gee, I tell you, the Shell Sierras have been looking very strong this year with the amount of power they're getting out of these engines. Very strong at Sandown, the power circuit, very strong here again. But Glenn Seaton's got the whole shot on this first lap. The Peter Jackson car looking so strong last year. Glenn had a bit of engine trouble in practice, but he leads them around on this first lap. It's Sierras everywhere as we take Dunlop race cam out of the inside of Johnson's car, leading his teammate Bow as they come under the Dunlop bridge, flying past our commentary position and under brakes for the very hard hairpin. Now, Johnson has to be very careful. He doesn't get uh, too far to the outside unless he's opening it up for Bow on the inside. But he sits here, cuts the corner, comes out. About ideal. And these two are having a fabulous race. And John Bow, don't uh, take him out of calculations because he's moved right up on the bumper of Dick Johnson. At this moment, I think it would bring a smile to Glenn Seaton's face because after a wretched run so far, Alan Moffat, he looks pretty sharp. Yes, he does, Mike. He's done a lot of testing here prior to the uh, run this weekend, and he's got his little Peter Jackson Sierra looking quite good. I would say that uh, Dick's got the got his handle at the moment. He's certainly within striking distance at any time. He's right in the slipstream if he wants to take advantage uh, and can take advantage on the straight. I think everybody's just being a little bit tippy-toey here at the moment. They've seen over the last two heats, what are the last two races what can happen in the second heat so we're uh, for my guess we're looking at just a little bit more conservative driving here there's the front running group i notice uh, one of the winfield nissan cars certainly up within the top six as glenn seaton 
the PJ Sierra, the exit to the hairpin hit, looks uh, pretty good, gets away out of that turn. Bo sits in behind team leader Dick Johnson as they come through this wide sweeper. It's rather deceiving on television, but the cars are very, very quick indeed. There's Mark Gibbs running back in the fourth spot, and I think that will probably be Peter Brock up into fifth, and then the first of the Winfield Nissans up into sixth spot. They have really done nothing in practice, but uh, watch them in the second heat later today. Only a couple of laps yesterday. They're really just enough to scuff in the tyres, get a time, and they'll get serious when the second heat comes round this afternoon. I'll tell you the big disappointment, the guy missing out of this battle at the front is Colin Bond. The guy was really surprising how much speed he's got out of the car. He was fastest here on Friday and very quick here yesterday. Got himself onto the front row in qualifying. But in the run this morning, he snapped a Conrad. They've had to do an engine change and Colin didn't appear on the grid this morning. So that's a great disappointment for Colin Bond and the Caltex team. Well, he'll no doubt be able to start in the second heat, which uh, takes place a little bit later. Very hard to change an engine in just a little over an hour. Of course, Johnson was faced with that dilemma, the bow car, last uh, week at uh, Sandown uh, in the, uh, the Peter Jackson dash early in the morning. He lost one completely, detonated one, and uh, they got it ready for the, uh, for the first heat. They must have been the, the really trick engine too because JB was able to run away from them last weekend at Sandown. Today, of course, at Simmons Plains, new set of circumstances and adversity um, besetting um, Glenn Seaton over the past couple of days, but it's all playing into his hands now as he leads the charge beneath the Dunlop Bridge. The order unchanged. Glenn Seaton out by two car lengths over Johnson, two back then to John Bow, and then ten back to Mark Gibbs, who has Peter Brock right on his tail. And then in car number two, it is Mark Scaife. Here comes Brock down the outside of Gibbs as they head into the hairpin. And the Commodores having quite a competitive run here, considering they haven't had a lot of testing time. Brock run down the outside, not the place to be. Gibbs gets the acceleration of the four-wheel drive Nissan out of there a little bit better. But watch the power advantage of the Commodore. Up about 50 horsepower on the GTR and 100 kilograms lighter. This is where power to, rate ratio, power to weight ratios come into play. Here's Scaife running in sixth position. His teammate Richards is still around the back of the field. Now that's a real change from last year. 12 months can make a lot of difference in motor racing. Last year the two Nissan GTRs lapped the field. Alan, uh, that pass by Brock was good. It was down the outside and uh, he got the power on at the same time as Gibbs. I was surprised to see him take the outside yeah. line into the hairpin. That's quite a delicate corner, and uh, he did it very nicely. Uh, stayed on the inside, didn't get bluffed out uh, on the short run out of the hairpin, and by the time they got to the uh, right-hander in the middle of that straight, as you said earlier, is quite tight and now holding uh, Gibbs off successfully. This is getting fairly interesting uh, back in the pack as we follow this dice between Peter Brock and the Mobile One Commodore. Mark Scaife coming up on the outside of Gibbs. Watch the acceleration of these cars, these four-wheel drives. They really do get it uh, down on the ground, and you can see Scaife already just trying to angle across to sit in the draft of Brock as they go through the right-hand kick. And he's got him perfectly positioned. Mark on the wrong line there. Meanwhile, the gap between the leading Fords and this battle is almost out to five seconds, so the Sierras really do have a straight-line advantage around here. A tricky circuit, Alan. You've been coming here for years. It doesn't have too much character, but it's um, it's quite fast. Well, it is fast, and uh, contrary to your comment, Mike, I always found it uh, quite intriguing. The few corners that are that are there, this one in particular, left-hander in front of the pits is very dead, making it look easy here today on camera. Another little wiggle to the right-hander here, and as we see, Scaife trying to uh, give Brocky a bit of a run, but you're going to have to get up earlier than that to outfox Brock into a corner like this. Maybe on the straight, he'll be able to take advantage of the draft. That Commodore, a fairly big car to tuck in behind. They don't really seem to be slingshotting as no. strongly off the corners as they used to. Michael, one might believe that there is something in the handicap. Well, well, of course, everyone's making it fairly political. I think the Holden boys would like to do away with the 7,500 RPM limiter. We go inside, uh, thanks to Dunlop, to uh, Dick Johnson's car. And Alan Moffat, as uh, he just pointed out, has been coming here for a number of years. Alan, like to talk us around the circuit, the gears, and... Um... Well, after last weekend, when I was in the wrong gear, uh, <laughs> our mate uh, Dick didn't like what I was calling there, but we're back through the pit straight, up, down, uh, past the start-finish line, uh, accelerate here at a good rate of knots, down, I would think, to the very bottom gear for this left-hand hairpin. He'll reef the wheel. That's about as much as you'll ever see a driver pulling it very nicely handled. You'll notice he doesn't take his hands off the wheels. If we could get everyone driving on the road that way, there'd be a lot less accidents. 
quick nip through. Now this doesn't look like much, but he's hanging on to it. You can see just coaxing it a little bit. Flat out, of course. Down to a left-hander under brakes. Coaxing it a little bit, and now just to the very outside of the real estate there. He's up quickly through the next gear. A bit bouncy through here. We just can't see out his window. But, and again, this little tight right and then left-hander in front of this, probably one of the most difficult corners you can see. Using, Dick is saving his tires here. He remembered at Sandown that he was perhaps a little bit too exuberant, ex exuberant, I beg your pardon. Well, we've got problems for the uh, Peter Jackson team already in the pits with uh, one of their cars. That's uh, Wayne Park's car. Yes, Wayne's been doing a good job. He's the 2IC to um, Glenn Seaton and the team. And uh, some good qualifying performances from uh, young Wayne, but uh, unfortunately the results aren't there at the moment. As we go back to the leader, Glenn Seaton, one in the pits, one out front of the pack. Johnson still running in the second spot, and JB, his team uh, partner, runs there in third. They look fairly comfortable at this stage, and uh, I would have thought maybe the Nissans, after um, some problems yesterday, or conserving rubber, may have been up. But you really can't just hang around for one heat only, the second heat. And you can't give away too much in qualifying, Michael. No. If you start, you want to start at the front, and uh, here we get an example of the three cars that were right on the one, two, uh, one, two, three on the grid uh, are showing that, look look at the gap between them, it's daylight between them, and Peter Brock coming through now with uh, Scaife still on his tail. The other good thing about this gap, and that is Brock, to Mark Scaife, and we'll get it on the other shot as I go down the back part of the course. Um, and you'll notice the BMW is already up behind Mark Gibbs. Now, that means Tony Longhurst has been able to get away from Jim Richards. <laughs> now, if you can explain that to me, Richards uh, is to position number nine. Yeah, Jim seems to be struggling down the back of the grid, but there's certainly no problems here for Brock, holding off the uh, number two Nissan of Mark Scaife. There we are inside Jimmy Richards' car, running back in position nine, as Michael said. Neil Crompton just in front of him in the second of the mobile Commodores. And this is quite an interesting uh, equation here. Richards running this far back in the field. We've seen them not doing very many qualifying laps when they come out. Last year, uh, yesterday, I think it was like a warm-up lap, a couple of maybe two quick laps, and they were back into the pitch, and that's the last we saw of the Nissans. A lot of people are saying that's a way to conserve tyres and possibly avoid the three-lap dash in the morning. But Mark Scaife assured me yesterday that they are absolutely driving these things flat out in qualifying. Well, I would say just listening to that engine, that it's certainly not straining either uh, engine or, or machine uh, or, or, or driver at this stage. It doesn't sound like uh, the Dick, the Jim Jimmy. Richards that yeah. we should know. Uh, that car is not, not revving at all. Uh, I don't know what they're frightened of, but... Uh, maybe we're being unkind with that criticism, but certainly there's no roar from that uh, six-cylinder engine. Well, here's the race leader, Glenn Seaton, the Peter Jackson Sierra, has, has promised a lot this season, and he's delivering it here today. He leads heat number one of the Shell Touring Car Championship. Dick Johnson runs in second in car number 17. John Bow, his teammate, is third. Then it's Peter Brock in 05, the Mobile One Commodore, and rounding out the five, Mark Scape in the Winfield Nissan GTR. Laser is Rubia. Laser is Zubia. Laser fits me. Yeah. And laser fits you and you and you. Laser is Rubia. Oh, you know what it'll do for you. Laser fits me. Back here at Simmons Plains, the dice for second continues as they go down to the left-hander at Coca-Cola Corner. And John Bow in car number 18 getting to the outside of team leader Dick Johnson. That moves him up into second. Johnson back to third now. Meanwhile, Glenn Seaton gets away from the pack in car number 30, the uh, Peter Jackson entry. This is a pretty absorbing team battle between the Shell Sierras and the Peter Jackson car. Glenn Seaton's car, his father Bo, builds the engines for them. And they also run on Bridgestone tyres, whereas the two Shell Sierras are running on Dunlop rubber. Dunlop are uh, using a new experimental tyre they've called the M3, which apparently is a big improvement on the previous uh, compounds. And only the Shell team are allowed to run it this year. And it's certainly given the Shell team a terrific uh, advantage in the opening rounds of the championship.
the exit to the hairpin and Mark Scaife, car number two, finding the inside line there on Peter Brock. They've been having a fascinating dice since this race started. See whether or not Brock can pull him back in straight line horsepower. Gee, I tell you what, he's close here. But he's on the brakes naturally. Just a very nasty left-hander. You, you have to be parallel with the car going into that corner before you could attempt any kind of a passing maneuver. He didn't quite have the moz on Mark Scaife there. And in fact, Scaife looks as if he had just been waiting to get by Brocky and now seems to be scooting away at will. He's throwing it around a little bit harshly, perhaps, but certainly with the testing they've done, they know what they can do to their cars. Well, he's a little more exuberant perhaps behind the wheel in his younger days than... Uh, uh, the Jimmy Richards, half distance completed. Race one of round three, the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship coming to you from Simmons Plains in Tasmania. Hope you're enjoying it across the uh, Seven Next Network. Look who's sitting in behind Brocky there, the first of the BMWs. We've said it once, we've said it a number of times. There's Wayne Park still in the pits with some sort of major engine problem. That's a great disappointment for the young Queenslander. Drafted into the Peter Jackson team. Ran for them at Bathurst last year and uh, not having too much of a good run at Simmons Place today. There we are, back with this battle between Scaife and Brock. Now, Scaife got past him a couple of laps ago, but Brock has really let him go. He seems to be hanging on reasonably well. The oh, Commodores are struggling around here. Oh, look at that massive brake lock up there. Oh, and he's gone. It must have a puncture. Now he's in the soft stuff. He's got the foot into it to try and get a bit of traction. He might get out. Yeah, I think he'll get out, OK? It's fairly dry down there, as you can see. <laughs> oh, the annual as Simmons can see. The Simmons Plains dust or... Well, he comes back on, and Neil Crompton gains three or four spots. A couple of angered uh, Peter Brock no end. Mm, well, you don't see that happen very no. often. I thought it was a puncture, but obviously not. Just a massive lock-up. Now, I guess Peter would have a big thumping flat spot on that tyre. Uh, he would, if he wasn't on a circuit here where he felt safe, he wouldn't wouldn't be continuing a at Bathurst with that kind of a lock-up. That was a monstrous lock-up. I uh, can't imagine what happened there. A little bit of a malfunction, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure he wouldn't have left his foot on the brake that long. Well, we saw him do a bit of that. I thought at Deweru Park in the second heat, he was um, he was locking them up a little. Not so much at Sandown, where they had a horsepower disadvantage, according to Peter. And in fairness to the mobile team, I mean, they look like the cars that uh, Brock and Larry were running last year, but really, they're setting up new facilities in Melbourne. They've got a lot of new team personnel, and uh, it really is effectively a new team. So they're struggling for development time and doing their best with the product they have. The Commodores are having a trouble here at Simmons Plains because the new rev limit that the cams have set for the engine 7,500 RPM. To keep the engines off the rev limit, they've had to gear the cars up a bit. That's giving them a slower speed out of these tighter corners. So, Brock down into the hairpin. Meanwhile, Wayne Park's still in the pits. Andy Raymond is there. Yes, exactly right. You saw Peter Brock's very wild slide into the sand coming round towards the Dunlop Bridge. Reports from the mobile team is that Brock is drastically running out of brakes. And as you can see behind me, the crew is ready for Peter to come in at any second. So we'll certainly be keeping our eye on the 05 mobile Commodore. Oh, right behind Seaton, there's Bow. one gone. Bauer's Bow. gone sideways. They must be jumping on the brakes down into the hairpin more than we anticipated. It is a tough corner. You do have to pull up for it. Uh, the brakes get a punishment there just behind the, or in front of the pits rather, but it's a fairly decent run down. And John Bell can say goodbye to this race now. He can't quite get himself. He doesn't want to upset everybody else coming around. He's been fairly sporting about the manner in which he's trying to extricate himself here, but he's resorted to uh, reversing out of the way. It looks like a lot of oil dripping out of that engine, Michael. I think he can yes, kiss I... it goodbye. He's just being polite here and getting out, uh -huh. out of the corner. He's not even trying. We take Nissan race cam now as Jimmy Richards comes beneath the Dunlop Bridge chasing uh, Mark Scaife. Seaton, meanwhile, leads by five and a half seconds, so uh, Bow having that mechanical failure there has taken the heat off the Peter Jackson car once and for all. Well, that's Although, a very nice gap, and it's the nicest cushion that Glenn Seaton's had in a long time. There goes Richards down the inside of Gibbs. No, but Gibbs comes back on the inside. Yeah. Mark's been leaving his braking very late down there, I've noticed, the last couple of laps, but Richards had a very good run out of the corner. Now it's a horsepower race. Side by side, door handle to door handle down the back straight. This is the battle for fifth and sixth. Richards has a nose in front, but Gibbs oh, has probably got the best position. He can, he can as stay the, with him as long as he stays parallel with him, but he had to... And Jim's uh, trying discretion. to Listen, race cam shows us. Richards goes a little bit deeper under brakes and leads Gibbs out of the corner. So he moves up to fifth. 
Gibbs goes one back down to sixth. There's Tony Longhurst going through. He's running fourth at the moment. And a similar gap back from first to second to third to fourth. Mark Scaife runs in third. And, uh, of course, Glenn Seaton leading it from uh, Dickie Johnson. This is going to slingshot Tony into the second heat very nicely if he maintains, even if he only maintains fourth position. He'll be on the second row of the grid for the start of the second heat and give him some very nice opportunities. About three laps remain in heat number one of uh, round three. The Shell Australian Touring Car Championships coming to you from uh, Simmons Plains in Tasmania. Watching it across the, uh, the Seven Network. Also through Star Television in Hong Kong and through Screen Sport in the United Kingdom and right throughout Europe. Hope you're enjoying our broadcast. As Glenn Seaton sets off on his last lap, coming down to the hairpin now. This will put a little joy back into uh, the PJ team. They did a bit tough, they had problems. Glenn probably needed a, a jet push truck to get him off the line at Sandown. He did. Uh, did not have any success there at all. And then, of course, when he did make his move, Thomas Mazira had a, a short back and sides onto the grass, and uh, Glenn had to take evasive action, and he went off at the same time. So things are looking a little better for them at Simmons Plains today. Yeah, we're looking at the end of... Uh, well, this is actually the fourth year of the Peter Jackson Sierra team. Glenn went out on his own after he left Nissan at the end of 1988. He struggled, and he's put an awful lot of work into this team. And deserve, a lot of his own money into the team as well. And deserve success. He's coming down to the last series of turns. This will give them some joy. The Peter Jacksons here of Glenn Seaton comes out, heading down to take the chequered flag. So Seaton takes heat number one. Dickie Johnson easing up, coming across the line, takes second. Not too far behind him was Mark Skay, followed by Tony Longhurst. Then uh, Jimmy Richards, Mark Gibbs and Alan Jones. Neil Crompton, the next one, and Wayne Park rounding out the finishes. Let's check them out for you on the Shell Race score. Gun Ho Glenn comes up with the money. First time around at Simmons Plains this afternoon. Dickie Johnson finishes in second. Mark Scaife third. Longhurst fourth. And Jimmy Richards in fifth spot. And we'll be back at Simmons Plains for a little superbike action after the break. Hong Kong wakes to the orientally subtle music of business already being done on the mobile phone. Was it not Confucius who wrote that a wise person of business is never without access to a mobile phone? In the Wan Chai district, if the mechanic hasn't got a spare camshaft for your Ferrari, he calls up Italy on a mobile phone. Wait? I didn't know she belonged to the number three hitman for the Hong Kong Tong until he called her up on her mobile phone. Yes, the people of Hong Kong are wise in the ways of business and the mobile phone. Yet there are voices here who say that the people of Australia are still wiser. Prawns, raw, one person. For hey. Telecom's mobile hey. net is better than anything they can call on in Hong Kong. Bye, guys. Telecom, Australian for so much better. And welcome back to Simmons Plains Raceway as the Superbikers line up on the grid now prior to their warm-up lap, ready to do battle in uh, round two of the Shell Oil Series as we welcome Neil Crompton from the cockpit, the flight deck of the Mobile One Commodore to join our seven team. Afternoon, Mike, and good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be back up here and standing by to have a look at these guys with the Superbikes, this first heat of the Shell Series. It certainly uh, should prove pretty exciting it, last weekend as any indication but before we take a look at the superbike action let's go down to the pits and andy raymond with the winner and winner of heat number one glenn seaton what a great drive oh, fantastic i'm just ecstatic um, we had a little bit of bad luck at sandown but it's all coming together this weekend i'm really happy it's certainly a bolt for the first corner isn't it the quick sierras up front but as the race drew on the nissans and even the bmws came of age yeah, that's right. This is where the next race is going to be fairly hard because the Sierra tyres will suffer now. And um, that's where the BMs and the Nissans will come through. So it's going to be a fairly tight race in this one. Andy Raymond with a very happy Glenn Seaton, the winner of round three, heat one of the Touring Car Championship. But it's Superbike time. Matthew Maladden has pole position from Malcolm Campbell on the Honda. From 3, 1, James Knight to Kawasaki. From 4, it's 30, Scotty Doohan. Position 5, 38, Roy Leslie on the Ducati. 6 is number 20, Troy Corsa. From 7, it's 16, Ben Archibald. From 8, it's Grant Hodson on that near stock Suzuki. From 9, it's 39, Chris Hill. And rounding out the 10, Peter Guest on the Yamaha. One second difference between Maladden and Campbell after qualifying. There's Campbell. The field assembling. 
tremendous lineup of superbikes in the starters' hands and racing. Doing a good jump, but Maladin goes very quickly down the inside, number 45, and leads the field as they head down towards turn one, which incidentally is smeared with oil, but it's Maladin. Look at the gap. Campbell in second place, Knight up to third. Scotty doing into fourth place. It's very treacherous up here. All sorts of wide and varied lines. One goes extremely wide, but the good news, the field through cleanly, and Maladin bolts into the distance. Interesting to see Maladin's race time here is eight tenths of a second under the, uh, Rob Phyllis's lap record in qualifying. He really is the pace man in the Superbike Series this year. And he's already opened up, a, looks like about a one and a half to two second gap as they come around for the first time. They haven't even completed a lap. Maladin gets the power down the ZXR 750R Kawasaki as they sweep through the field. Field very tightly bunched. A nice mix there it is. The Kawasaki of Maladin under brakes as he swings onto the main straight. Matthew's on a mission this weekend to get some more points. Had a problem in heat one at round one last weekend at Sandown. Malcolm Campbell with a reasonable gap over Scotty Doohan. And someone in trouble there, 16. Is that Roy Leslie in the Duke? Or is it Archibald? It's uh, Ben Archibald. That's, yeah, it's his teammate. The Duke Caddy. <laughs> He's had a nasty hemorrhage oh, there. Oh, someone went right off the end of 1,000 miles an hour. He vanished from our screens in a split second. You can't see him there. But someone went off very quickly. Scott Doohan, meanwhile. Malcolm Campbell and Matthew Malatin well, just disappearing off into the distance. And that's interesting because doohan has gone through, but Campbell comes back on the outside. It's a bit rough out there, the Honda wobbling around. Battle between the Yamaha and the Honda. Campbell aboard the RC30. Bike is getting fairly old in superbike terms, and in front of him the OWO1 Yamaha. Scott Doohan, who was so quick at Sandown, had a bit of bike trouble yesterday, fuel starvation in his race bike. And now he's riding his spare in the race. Whether it's set up as well as the race bike, we'll find out as he leads Campbell onto the straight for the second lap. Just about every lap yesterday when he came under the bridge, it was absolutely shuddering the back wheel, out against the guardrail. But uh, Mal Campbell keeping the pressure on as they come down to the hairpin. There's one that hasn't made it on the top end of the circuit. Incidentally, uh, Matt's got a lead of two and a half seconds after these first three laps. Someone's come unstuck just past the pits. There's Maladin. Well, Maladin's got a history of doing this. Is Sandown. He had a five-second lead after two laps, and he also set a new lap record. And uh, Doohan's getting away from Campbell. So I think there's the answer to your question, Mark. Ooh. Oh, someone else has come off on the slow corner approaching the main straight. There's a lot of hay there. Officials trying to kick it off the track before they come round. Yellow flags are out. Scott Doohan approaching that point now. As we thought, most of the oil, of course, was down at the hairpin, although it's had a, a liberal coating all day, you say, now. It's pretty slippery out there. There was certainly lots of commotion in the touring car race, Mike. The bits and pieces flying everywhere and all sorts of fluids. And it's also extremely windy. You can see the debris. Now, that won't affect the touring cars nearly as much as it'll affect these fellas on the superbikes. But look at Malcolm there, really starting to slither around as he tried to put the power to the ground. James Knight in fourth position. I think Troy Corse is the next man in the distance there. And that little blip on the horizon was, was Matthew Maladin. Well, there's a great shot from our Eastern Creek 500 AGP race cam. Of course, the big event out there on Sunday, April 12. We've got our Dewan and Wayne Gardner do it for Australia, but some fabulous pictures out of Sandown. And I'll give you an idea of just how much buffeting Scotty Dewan is getting around this circuit because it seems to be blowing a minor gale at this stage. And listen to how tentative he tries to put the power on coming out of the corner. These things are enormously powerful for their size and weight, about 140 brake horsepower. They've revved them to something like 13,000 revs. So Leslie's okay. Yep. So both the Ducati runners in trouble. Ben Archibald had a problem. Roy Leslie up on his feet, which is tremendous. Back to Foster's 500cc Australian Grand Prix race cam. And listen to this Yamaha scream. This is the fast right-hander down the back straight. <laughs> you want to see commitment from uh, a guy involved in racing. You look at these guys on superbikes. They really give it everything they've got. This is from this point on. The track is very twisty and, and fairly slippery as we go back to Maladin. You'll notice that when we go back to race cam later on, they're very ginger with the throttle. They just caress the thing. So Maladin off on his way, just pops a little wheelie out under the Dunlop Bridge, gets the last lap board and looking pretty cheeky. 3.8 second lead now Maladin after such a short distance. Hasn't he got a fabulous future? He's just so fast and he's doing a great job for Kawasaki 
Aaron Slight, of course, who rode the full series last year, opting to do only a few rounds this year, but ride in the World Superbike Championship. They've drafted Malatin into the squad as uh, team leader. Half distance in this opening heat of the Superbike Series. Malatin leading very comfortably. Kawasaki ZXR750. Tremendous machine, this Aaron Slight used it so effectively in the Superbike Championship last year. And there's the gap back to Scott Dewan on the Yamaha in second position. Scotty Dewan, older brother, not younger brother of Mick Dewan, the Grand Prix star, 28 years of old, 28 years of age, lives in Brisbane. And he was runner-up in the Superbike Series last year, so he'll be looking for one better than that this year. I think he's drifting back into the, into yeah. the uh, clutches of James Knight. And Malcolm Campbell. James Knight, Matthew Maladden's teammate. Drafted into the team as Aaron Slight headed overseas to contest the World Superbike Championships. There he is, bike number one. See them just navigating out around the outside of that oil spill where John Bauer came unstuck in the first round of the touring cars. James Knight tucks in behind and Mal Campbell is ahead down this incredibly fast back straight. 250 kilometres an hour on the superbikes. Look at that. That takes a lot of bravery. He'll swing to the inside of him here to get the lie to the left-hander. Can't. Then again, Wally Campbell knows his way around this place. Malcolm was very strong under brakes that time. The Kawasaki would seem to have the legs in a straight line. Can't put it to such good effect here because of the undulations and twists in the course. And you notice there that Malcolm's actually taken the pressure off himself a little bit in that part of the circuit. But watch the Kawasaki after they go beneath this bridge and see whether or not bike number one bridges the gap. Doohan, Campbell, Knight. Maladin's disappeared. He's out in the lead. And the last is extending his lead too, 5.1 seconds. Every lap it gets bigger. This guy is really on a roll. Well, the Kawasaki, in fact, I think lost ground on yes, the straight that time, but we'll see whether he makes it up up this back straight. Quite a done. suitable deputy deputy for uh, Aaron Slight, this James Knight. Two times Australian production bike champion. That was the 1,000cc machines. The this. And there he is, having a look down the inside of uh, Campbell, certainly keeping him honest. Mal Campbell, an extremely experienced campaigner on these bikes. He'll have a, every inch of the road covered. James Knight's going to have to work very hard, as you can see, as the bike squiggles under power coming out of the corner. He's doing a good job on the Winfield Honda. Mal Campbell. I'll tell you what, young uh, Knight is keeping him fairly honest. Milan, of course, has just disappeared. He's often gone out to five and a bit seconds over the field as Knight gives chase after Campbell and they're both chasing uh, Scotty Doohan on the uh, Peter Jackson Yamaha. This time I think James is better positioned than he's been in the last couple of laps. James Knight spends a fair bit of his time in Malaysia now, getting involved in the superbike scene over there. He was second in the Malaysian Championship last year as he goes down the inside again, but Campbell holds on. Or does he? Better run, better run out of the corner too. Watch Campbell under brakes though, up the inside. Gosh. Boy, that's that is, strong braking performance. That is going deep under brakes. You couldn't do much more than that. James Knight had the best run out of the corner. Pinned him on the main straight, and then Campbell very, very heavily under brakes. And he they takes just, the lead as they come back toward the main straight. They are a sensational sight round Simmons Plains, the superbikes. Marginally quicker than the tourers. And they are just so close to the guardrail. Last lap, Aladdin's already gone. Here's the battle for third and fourth. Tremendous battle. James Knight tries it on the brakes again. Very even here. But he's Campbell. got to stay away from the oil. Do you yep, notice how yep. he got out of that? He just yeah. he looked up there and thought, well, this is curtains. I've got to get out of this spot. And Campbell has one look, knows where he is. <laughs> Try and keep him at bay. Look at the tremendous acceleration of the Kawasaki out of that slow corner. These things really have an enormous amount of power. And watch the gap again and see whether Malcolm can shoot down the inside. Boy, oh, can he brake light? Hello, we've got a replay of the last lap. That's staggering. Does that Honda brake well? And there's the man in second place. Can't do anything about my lad, Scott Dewan. The Peter Jackson Yamaha. Try as hard as he may, and there is the leader and the winner. Matthew Maladin pulls his traditional wheel stand as he comes across the line to win heat one of round two of the Shell Superbike Series. Behind him, there's Scott Dewan, pulls a wheelie, and Malcolm Campbell. Oh, he got a back Campbell for third. Yes. And oh, James Knight in fourth. You just don't wobble with Wally here at uh, Simmons Plains. He's got the place down, Pat. You can't take anything away from Matt Maladin. Boy, is he looking strong for the Shell Oil Superbike Series this year. He's got the wood on them on the fast circuits, no doubt about it. But we saw a fascinating scrap there for the minor placings and a very good second to uh, Scotty Dewan on the Peter Jackson Yamaha.
So, checking them out for you on our Shell race score, Matt Maladden, the winner of heat number one on the Kawasaki, Scotty Doohan on the Peter Jackson Yamaha in second, Mal Campbell, the Winfield Honda in third, then James Knight on the Kawasaki in fourth and rounding out the five, Troy Corser on the Yamaha and back at Simmons, just a sec. The BMW 3 Series has been honoured with motoring awards and public acclaim in Germany, Great Britain and Australia, which is hardly surprising for these awards are judged by the same criteria BMW use, placing advancement in design, engineering excellence, safety, and value under meticulous scrutiny. As these accolades would suggest, it's not merely BMW who regard the 3 Series as the ultimate driving machine. Welcome back to Simmons Plains and the Formula Fords come out now for round two of the Motocraft Formula Ford Driver to Europe series. But before we take a look at the Fords, let's go down to the pit lane with Andy Raymond and Matt Maladden. And what a victory it was. Go to Kawasaki's Matt Maladden. They say you're the boy to beat in the Superbike series. You've gone out and gave the guys a big beating there. Yeah, you know, we've got everything together. The bike's working really well. Uh, shell lubrication going throughout the bikes makes it very reliable. And uh, I think, you know, we should be right for the next one again. What's the difference? Matt Maladden's 20 years of age, first year in the Superbikes. I mean, what is the difference between some of the other guys and yourself? Oh, you know, I don't really know. I go out there, I ride to the best of my ability. I try and ride 110% all the time when I ride. And uh, like I said, the bike's working really well, and I think Kawasaki makes it a lot easier to win on. You'd better believe it. The uh, Formula Fords are out on the racetrack. Let's take a look at the lineup today for the Motocraft driver to Europe series. John Blanchard on pole with one double zero four seven. Michael Dutton starts out of position number two in the Swift, and from three, it's Cameron McConville in the Van Diemen. Ron Searle in another Van Diemen starts out at four, and from five, it's Steve Ellery. From position number six, Stephen Richards, the son of Jimmy Richards. From seven, 16, Craig Lowndes. From eight, Gary Croft in the Swift. From nine, Stephen White in another Swift, and ten, telling them out is Con Taparis. Ten seconds away from the start now. The Formula 4 driver to Europe series. Off the line, and John Blanchard gets the run. Michael Dutton going up very quickly on the inside of him. This big field of Formula Fords heads down to the left-hander. And John Blanchard, is he going to make it? A couple of with late lunges here, including Michael Dutton, as they go into uh, that tight left-hander. It'll be Blanchard to lead out of Dutton all through that first turn safely head down towards the sweeper. Blanchard made a great jump, got away cleanly. The whole field threw that tight left-hander at the end of the front straight. Still lots of debris up there. Richard Dutton having looked down the inside of Blanchard. Two Swifts leading the contest. And Cameron McConville in the first of the Van Diemens taps onto the back of this battle. John Blanchard, the man who was pinged for no noise infringements at Amaru, which was quite a controversial matter. Put him out of the running in the opening round of the championship, so he's out for a vengeance in Tasmania this weekend. Well, he won't have to worry about noise here. The only thing he could disturb within a hundred kilometre radius is sheep. <laughs> Beneath the Dunlop Bridge, and Blanchard doing a good job keeping um, Michael Dutton at bay. First cars covered by less... Well, the first seven cars, I think it was, uh, covered by less than a second in qualifying. So the Formula Fords are very close here at Simmons Plains this weekend. Stephen Richards had a big lunge down the inside that time in the yellow and blue Van Diemen. Saw a very close scrap between these guys in a preliminary race this morning. They're very evenly matched. John Blanchard, Richard Dutton in the red Swift SC92 tucks into the draft, pulls out wide. Well, look at this. It is on for young and old as they go down to the left-hander. Dutton, Michael Dutton, making a huge run here. He's had three name changes in three laps. They come out going beneath the bridge. Still John Blanchard there. Hauling them in is Dutton. And Richard's qualifying well, as uh, Neil had said, and he's right in this. He's coming along quite nicely, Stephen Richards. He's doing a fabulous job, isn't he? Uh, Mark, there's been a scheme announced this week to encourage the teenagers and younger drivers towards bigger things. Yes, so Shell and Auto Action, the motorsport magazine, have combined uh, in an award. As they come down hard under brakes, we'll get onto that award a little bit later. No, he's not going to be able to do anything there. Blanchard's got him covered. Uh, they've announced an award where the young guys, anyone under 25 years of age who's been competing in the championship uh, no earlier than the beginning of last year, is eligible for an award, uh, and that'll involve uh, 
the highest point scorer in that championship. We've got a test drive with Dick Johnson's shell team at the end of the year. So that's quite a thing to aim for. Dutton's up in the right spot yep. this time. He gets up on the left, which puts him on the inside for the next left-hander. Gets the nose up on the inside and does the job. Nice bit of driving. Conville closes in on Blanchard too. Gee, they're close. Ron Searle there in fourth place. And Stephen Richards in fifth. Good battle between the chassis too. Van Diemen's and Swifts. Swifts uh, looking very strong here. Great new aerodynamic package. A much stiffer chassis. They were doing a lot of work and uh, the car is looking very strong. The car is very evenly matched. 110 horsepower. Ford 1600cc engine. Four-speed gearbox. They run on virtually road tyres. But boy, I tell you, the chassis advancements they're making in these cars are terrific. Well, I don't think Blanchard uh, has finished with the challenge yet. He'll try and position himself on the inside of Dutton, perhaps, at Coke Corner. It's if he can get close enough, riding the draft down here through the right-hand kink. Now, that Auto Action Shell uh, program is great to see. We've had two coming together. Oh, I'm glad that was at the tail of the field. Oh, where's he going? Nowhere. Well, not if you park it there, but anyway, the, the idea was right. That was Craig Lowndes. Craig Lowndes. He did so well at Amaru in the wet. Did. Yeah, that's... That's a bit disappointing for him, but anyway, he's up and running again. The two Swifts looking pretty sharp here at the moment. Don't what I was going to make about that um, Dick Johnson um, auto action competition is giving some of the younger guys an opportunity straight out of uh, some of the more exciting categories of, of motorsport. It's a policy that this and I know uh, our co-commentator Alan Moffat has certainly pursued with young drivers to bring them on. Greg Hansford, as we've seen, only one of a number. And that's the way these guys are going to get to step up into touring cars because it is just far too expensive to go out and launch yourself and uh, try and buy a touring car and go racing at the top end. And I'm sure you'd agree with that, Neil. It takes too long, unfortunately. So they're concentrating on this battle for the lead between John Blanchard, who's chasing Michael Dutton. Well, he's still there. And I think that uh, Blanchard's still pretty handily placed here at the moment. He's getting, the, getting in the draft, and he'll try and look for a run down the inside. Comes up on the inside now. Can he outbreak him? Yes. So comfortably back into the lead. That was very nicely done. And a lead change again. McConville still in third place. And I think Ron Searle and Stephen Richards side by side that time. And Stephen's got through. So Stephen Richards moves to fourth. Ron Searle drops back one spot. So it's two Swifts and then a couple of Van Diemen's. Cameron McConville there in third place. Here's the pace man of the weekend, though. John Blanchard, the pole man. And Michael Dutton, who was second on the grid. So they've had the pace all weekend. Here comes Dutton under brakes. Thought about it. Half distance. And locks up. up. But Blanchard will get into the hairpin in front. And now will cover his tracks as they get out of this turn and work their way down to the sweeper. Keeping in mind he wants to be on the, uh, the left side of the road. And that's exactly where he's planning on being right now. Which opens the gap up a little just on the... Uh, on the kink here. These he's, cars. Got to, he's got to go the long way around and try and stay there, but can't. These cars are so evenly matched, it really does come down to look to driver ability and who's braver on the day. He wants to go deeper under brakes. He's got a better run out of the corners under the long straights. And whoever can take advantage of the aerodynamic effect of tucking in behind the guy in front. But uh, all this ducking and diving has allowed Cameron McConville to move up a bit closer in third place. So we're going to have a triple treat in a moment. Getting a bit sideways as they come through the corner there. You can tell when these guys are really going for it when the cars start to get out of shape. They usually try and drive them as straight as possible. Great shot there of them coming uh, beneath the Dunlop Bridge as Michael Dutton brings them down to the hairpin yet again. Michael Dutton, Van Diemen mounted last year and I think uh, 1990, I remember that awful accident he had in Amaru Park when he went over and over in a big crash at the bottom of Dunlop Loop. Well, he's got a nice new swift chassis this year and showing a lot of form. 27 years of age, an electrical contractor from New South Wales. And he was second in the Australian Grand Prix support race last year. And he's Van Diemen as John Blanchard does the same thing as Dutton last lap. He's on the outside. And we're going to have another brave session under brakes. And Dutton's got him covered. Dutton will win that one. Only because he was in the right spot at the right time. Sort of frustrating John Blanchard just a little. He, he makes one or two runs. I'll tell you, as a nursery formula, this is not that cheap motor racing. I think about uh, 1982 guys were doing this season for about ten or $15,000. Now to buy a drive for someone like Phoenix Motorsport, it's costing you about $130,000 with a new chassis and engine. So a lot of money involved in this uh, nursery category. Dutton. Meanwhile, McConville's moved up. Made it a three-car train as they break hard for the 180-degree hairpin at the bottom of the main straight. 
when you get these aerodynamic battles going on, you could easily see Cameron McConville win this race if he plays it correctly. He's losing a little bit of ground as he comes out the hairpin. That's Con Taparis. His car, um, he was quicker off the rough. Looks like Dutton got a bit around of the corner. Blanchard goes down the inside. It's side by side. And once again, the braking duel at the end of the straight. Dutton's won more of these than... No, Blanchard's got him covered. Great move from John Blanchard. That was good driving to be able to outbreak him and then get round the outside and take ground off him without touching wheels. So Blanchard, the aggressor, and I think he's pulled the right move at the right time as they come down to the last corner. Now this there's any desperation down the inside on the grass here. He's not close enough. Blanchard keeps it straight. He's got this one in the bag. Michael Dutton can do nothing about it. Well, as they take the checker. That was good. John Blanchard, I would have had my money on Michael Dutton, but... John Blanchard getting up in the Palm Air Swift. Michael Dutton uh, placing second in that, and Cameron McConville for uh, third. And there's the rest of the field finishing off. Let's check them out for you and confirm on the Shell Race score. A good win that to John Blanchard. Good dive in the last uh, couple of corners. Michael Dutton places in second. McConville takes third. Gary Croft takes fourth, and Ron Searle rounds out the five. A few of the boys are surprised when I bought a Mitsubishi Magna. I've been a Falcon man all my life, same as my dad. And my heart said, stick with what you know. But 10 minutes into test drive in the Magna, my head said, no competition. The feel, the handling, the dash, they're all spot on. And the Magna's responsiveness, I well, was beautiful. Everything was at my fingertips. It's a damn sight cheaper than the Falcon. And while there's cheaper cars around still, the Magna's got a kind of quality you remember long after you've forgotten the price. Back here at Simmons Plains in beautiful Tasmania, we've got the Tui's Gold Star drivers warming up for their second round of the Tui's uh, National Series. Interesting series and a good field here. Not uh, a 16 car lineup as we uh, had at Sandown but there's still a quality lineup. Mark Scaife, pole position, 51-41, and sharing the front row is Tasmanian Paul Stokel. Out of position number three, Mark Larkham in the Reynard, and from 4-10, it is John Briggs. From five, it's Stephen Cramp in the Reynard, and starting out of position six, Chris Hocking in the Hocking 911. From 7-4, Ron Barnacle in the Tafe Rolf. From 8-7, Alan Galloway in another Rolf. From nine, it's eight, John Herman. And starting out of position number 10, Paul Collins in the Liston BF3. About 10 seconds away from the start of round two of the Tui's Gold Star Series, our national open wheel formula from Simmons Plains, Tasmania, off the starting line. And getting away very quickly on the inside was Mark Scaife. Really had to fight Stokel off the line. They're fairly close as they come up to the hairpin for the first time. And they're all trying to drop into the inside. Stokel can't get across there. He's trying desperately to. Scaife will lead them into the turn. Gee, cramp down the inside was all locked up and for Stokel pretty wide, got all out of shape, so Stokel dropped back a lot there. We've got Mark Larkham up into second place, Stephen Cramp in third place, so the two Reynard 90Ds second and third. John Briggs is fourth in the Dave Moore car, and Mark Scaife is the leader in the SPA, the car designed and purpose-built for Formula Brabham Racing, designed by Gary Anderson, the man behind the Jordan Formula One team and built up at Litchfield in England. His car in second place, Mark Larkin, the Reynard, then another Reynard in third place, Stephen Cramp. Cramp did a great job at Sandown and ran in third place there. And look at this battle for the minor placings as Stokel now comes back in the car that was originally designed and built by the Croydon Park TAFE College in Adelaide. Briggs down the inside, the rolled RT21. Oh, Cramp's got the fronts all locked up. Paul Stokel's gone into the back of him and up the escape road. Stephen Cramp, the local man, trying to turn the car around. Here he <laughs> Ooh, dust. Look, I think someone else went off into the dust then too. He's burying himself here. And there's uh, Stokel back onto the track. 88 still stuck there. Oh, listen to the gearbox screaming in this thing. It's just, you can, you've got to drop him in gear at slow revs. Paul Collins in the list and gets away as well. There's the race leader, Mark Scape. Scape now leads by 2.8 seconds. Now, let's have a look at the replay as they go back to the hairpin at the end of the main straight and see what happened a couple of laps earlier. Now, Cramp locks up the front left, then the front right as well. He plows on, he can't make the turn. You had Stokel making a fairly brave move, trying to go down the inside, couldn't do it. Tapped the back of Steve Cramp, 
Meanwhile, John Briggs on the inside in the yellow car disappears. Stokel off into the boonies, and then Steve managed to get the car. He actually bottomed it out. He couldn't move anywhere because the, the ride height on these cars is so low that it was belly uh, down on the road. He couldn't get the thing to drive I think drive he could it. have read that a little better, to tell you the truth. Uh, going into a hairpin like that and seeing anyone in front of you in Whoa. trouble, you have to start making What's some arrangements. Mark Scaife coming Scaife into the pits. In. He's only done two or three laps, and there's a problem here, so that gives the lead to Mark Lowe. It's a stop-go penalty, so it'll be interesting to know the technicalities behind that. Maybe he jumped the start. But he's, it looks like he's come out in front of Mark Larkham. Only just. Larkham up on the outside, challenging. Oh, and Larkham to the lead. This will be a refreshing change for Larkham and the ex-Eric van der Poel, Eddie Jordan, Formula 3000 car. Converted to Formula Bram and Specs and doing very well today. They're lacking on development time with this car. And as Neil said earlier, they had troubles with gearbox at Sandown. Mark Scaife also had troubles with straight line speed, but he hasn't got that problem here today as he ducks down the inside of Larkham. I think... Uh, Mark has trimmed a little better aerodynamically in a straight line than Mark Scaife, that is, than Mark Larkham. Larkham had terrible trouble at Sandown, as you'll recall, with gearbox problems. But they've got a transverse gearbox in these cars, and much cleaner aerodynamically at the back of the car where the diffuser is. Um, this weekend they've been having trouble with uh, front belts on the engine, but I think they've now finally got it all under control in the Mitre 10 entry. This is one of two cars that Sydney businessman Peter Boylan brought into the country. Quirks Refrigeration, and uh, they've taken the challenge to bring some of these new carbon fibre chassis cars and uh, inject some interest into the class, and I think we've got a lot more to come. Indeed, Mark Scaife is bringing one of the new, or last year model, 91 Lolas in that was run by the Dam's uh, Marlborough factory team out of France, uh, driven by Laurent Aiello. Certainly an interesting technical battle too, because the Spa is an aluminium honeycomb tub car and the Raynard is one of the new carbon fibre chassis. Neil, tell us about the tyres on this class. It's a control tyre, I understand. That's correct. They, they all use a Dunlop tyre, the same construction and compound, and you mark your chosen new set of tyres for official qualifying, and you must use them for both your sessions of, of qualification and also for the race. So similar rules to the touring cars, Alan, and that means you've got to be kind to your tyres, and it also keeps costs under control and it uh, stops people from throwing endless amounts of rubber at their car. But it's good to see that um, Larkham's finally getting up and having a run in this car now after having just an unbelievable run trying to get the whole thing together in time. In third place, we've got John Briggs driving the Dave Moore Rolt RT21, which more recently has been driven by Mark McLaughlin. Scapes over the lead up to 2.1 seconds on Larkham, so he's uh, got a fair bit more race speed. Here's the gap back to John Briggs. It's quite a substantial gap too, there it is. Bit of fresh air there, but Briggs is doing very well in this car this weekend. I watched him in qualifying yesterday, and support from Tag Heuer watches, and uh, he was very aggressive, particularly through this part of the course, and driving very hard and enjoying the car. He was finding the setup of this car it's more comfortable than, than the car that he had previously owned. For four, his laps. Sorry, Neil, four laps to go. John Briggs, a former sports sedan racer. He used to run a Monza with some success a few years ago. You'll recall that uh, uh, this car, uh, in actual fact, was driven by John Smith in um, the 1990 mm. Australian Drivers' Championship and part of the 89 mm. Championship. Smithy had an all-time shunt in Phillip Island in the car. But Dave Moore, the owner of the car, has done a massive amount of research and development and development engineering on the tub of this car to get some rigidity into the, the tub, the chassis, and try and bring it up to the spec of these newer and higher tech cars. Two laps to go for Mark Scaife as he swings into the hairpin. 25 years Ooh, of age. Wow. Some aggro at the end of the, the straight, I think, that time. Yeah. The other car being lapped there. That was, uh, I think Steve Cramp is up and running again. He's managed to unbeach the Reynard. And... Uh, I think Larkham made a bit of a lunge at trying to get through on the inside at the end of that last lap. As I said before, these were sister cars that uh, Peter Boylan brought into the country. This car of Larkham's was run by Eric van der Poel, who's now driving in Formula One. This was run in the 1990 International Formula 3000 Championship, and it was operated by the GA Motorsport team, and that's owned by Mike Collier. And uh, I had a run against the, it, the sister car in England in 1990 and they were very well prepared cars and Larkham and his team have done a lot of work and there's the other car there. I think I said at Sandown that was an 89D, I must have had my glasses on backwards because uh, that's one of the newer cars. Last lap, Mark Scaife on his way to victory in round two of the championship. Good performance for Mark Larkham to hold on to second place and get some valuable points as they 
try and get some time to develop the chassis further. There's the leader, Mark Scaife, 25 years of age. He makes it look easy, but the Winfield team put a lot of time and effort into the, preparing this car for him. And uh, if you can't finish, you can't win anything. And I think they've prepared the car to win, and Mark Scaife's pointed it in the right direction here this afternoon. Yeah, nice, comfortable, controlled, intelligent drive from Scaife. He comes through the final left-hander and gets some valuable points and an all-important victory in round two of the Tui's Australian Drivers' Championship for 1992. And that's the gap. Back to second place, Mark Larkham, and he'll sigh a big sigh of relief that he's got the car home and got some points. And he'll prepare himself now for the next round at Winton and I think be in very competitive shape there. And there's third place, John Briggs, in the Rolt RT21. To his race score confirms that Mark Scape is the winner from Mark Larkham. Third place went to John Briggs. Great performance from Chris Hocking to come up there in fourth place. And Paul Stoke will recover to finish fifth in the Eastern Creek car. And we're back after the break. Welcome back to Simmons Plains Raceway. We're preparing for heat number two of the Shell Oil Superbike Series. Saw Matt Malatin take the opening heat a little earlier in our telecast today. And he's back, qualifying yesterday at 54-16. Out of position number two, it's Malcolm Campbell on the Winfield Honda. James Knight on the second of the Kawasaki's out of three. And four, it's Scotty Doohan on the Peter Jackson Yamaha from five. Roy Leslie and the Ducati, who had a fall earlier. Tony Corsa. On the Yamaha starts out at six from seven, it's Ben Archibald on the second of the Ducatis from eight, Grant Hodson on the Melbourne Suzuki from nine, Chris Hill on the Winfield Honda, running out the ten, Peter Guest on the new era Yamaha. So can Matt Maladden put another one together here today at uh, Simmons Plains? Absolutely outstanding in the, uh, the first heat earlier today. And can Malcolm Campbell perhaps uh, dislodge uh, Scotty Doohan? Not too far off the start. Should be a ripper. An absolute blinding start this time from Mal Campbell, who gets out. But Matt Maladin comes up the inside of him, looking to take over the lead in the first turn, working his way <laughs> to the inside. Actually, uh, Campbell couldn't have got off the line any quicker there. There's no doubt about Maladin. He was on the throttle there. You can see the back wheel skipping as he was breaking. Maximum break in that first corner. He's cleaned up the Hondas, and away he goes in the back straight again almost a repeat of heat one as he opens up that big gap on the opening lap on the back straight. There's Mal Campbell in second. James Knight getting up very smartly. He separated the two Winfield Honda riders as they come down to the left-hander and Coca-Cola. Still uh, Mal Campbell back in second. James Knight, then Scotty Doohan, uh, two back from there. Chris Hill made a good start as well. I thought that he was very brave going up the inside the hairpin on the first lap. Lots of debris there from all the garbage that came down earlier in the day, but he managed to survive, and he's still in the top five in battling, but it's Maladin that leads at the end of lap one. Campbell in second place, then Knight, then Chris Hill, then Corsa and Doohan, two Yamaha riders side by side, and the full field goes through as we take Eastern Creek Race Cam. Fabulous shots here into the hairpin. Notice a bit of chatter from the rear brake as the bike went in there. Absolutely hard on the picks. And listen to this. 13,800 RPM in this Yamaha OWA1. Unbe unbelievable revs. Taking the inside route on Chris Hill in the second of the Winfield Hondas. Two. Great shots of our Eastern Creek um, AGP race cam. Two. And there's the other view. 240 kilometres an hour down the back straight, hard on the brakes, back through the gears, and here he is. And just listen to how he's just having to gingerly feed that throttle in. They've got an enormous amount of power as he comes out of the corner. And there's Maladin in first. Mal Campbell, number four, in second. And James Knight, the Kawasaki teammate, in third. 
Lorenzo Campbell beneath the bridge. Well, Malat certainly got his head down, but the other guys are a bit closer than they were th at this distance in the first heat. They're Mal Campbell hard under brakes, back through the gears. James Knight, who shattered him all the way through in the first heat, and a terrific scrap. Campbell eventually beating him to the flag. Doing back there in uh, fourth spot. And there goes James Knight down the inside. Once again, tremendous acceleration from the Kawasaki. But as we saw in the first heat a number of times, Mal Campbell came back very strongly under brakes. There's a guy off at the end of the straight. Glad he didn't get the portal, though. No. <laughs> But Mal wasn't able to get him under brakes that time, so James Knight's figured out the braking sequence at the end of the back straight. So it's a Kawasaki 1-2 as they come back toward the main straight. Mal Campbell in third. The ZXR 750 is really a quick motorcycle at the moment. The Team Kawasaki boys, headed by Peter Doyle and engines from uh, Wayne Smith, are uh, working very, very well. It's a good combination. They've obviously done their testing, done their homework, and... Uh, they're getting the most out of these bikes, but gee, you couldn't help but be impressed by the braking performance of the Honda in the first heat earlier in the day. Well, Kawasaki really do put all their resources into Superbike and Formula One racing. They're not interested in running the 500cc Grand Prix. They don't think it relates to their products at all. They put all their money into their production-based bikes. And gee, it really pays off this ZXR 750, a superior machine. The R designates a special race special to comply with the homologation rules that come under. Here's number six, the guy who well, number eight is it? He went off the end of the straight, trying to bump the to bike. Uh, qualified yeah. 10th after his run in qualifying yesterday. So Maladin, Knight, Campbell, one, two, and three. A little gap then back to Scott Doohan. It's quite obvious this kid just loves his racing. He was giving it absolutely everything yesterday in uh, in practice and qualifying. Is Doohan going through? Then the next group behind him. Scott Dewan, Peter Jackson Yamaha, the man who was runner-up in the Superbike Series last year, won the round at Lakeside. Now you'll and notice he's a little closer this time to Mal Campbell. We should get uh, some great race cam vision when he gets in amongst them here. They head down the back straight through the right-hand kink. Closing on Campbell now. Down to the left-hander at uh, Coca-Cola Corner. As we take the Eastern Creek AGP race cam with a reminder that uh, Goddard, Gardner and Dewan doing it for Australia and the big AGP class there on the 12th of uh, April. Into the left-hander. I can remember the day, Neil, I think one of our first telecasts when we set you up on one of these and asked you to give us a, a tour de force. Well, it was just an unbelievable experience and I've ridden plenty of bikes, but not uh, road racing devices like this never been on a superbike that day it was the 1000cc yamaha run by michael dowson and uh, i was the all-time uh, girl on the thing i was pretty slow <laughs> but in a straight line it was lovely it's doing closing a little on campbell but we know how good and how effective the honda is under brakes at the end of that straight but he is closer this time now campbell is making uh, no inroads on james knight Kawasaki at this stage looking good for a 1-2 out of this second heat today. Look at the back of the Honda walking round as Campbell applies power. Goes through the left-right sequence up onto the straight. Really was frightening watching these guys coming through here in qualifying. They flat out through the corner, they drift out toward the arm, come just about touch it. That's, you couldn't get much closer than that. No, Scott doing right up behind Campbell as they come through the 180 degree hairpin and head onto the back straight. Here we go. Inside or outside? It'll be the inside. No shortage of power from the Yamaha. Oh. Ducks inside Campbell. Now Campbell's right in the toe and he'll go outside under brakes. Very hard. We've seen the RC30's braking capacity, but no, he's not going to do it this time either. The Yamaha picks him up. Scott Dewan up to third. Campbell hangs on to fourth. He's got closer again. And Maladin still disappearing with this one. This is uh, a great scrap. The second, third and fourth. Matthew's lead now three and a half seconds over his teammate James Knight. And this great scrap, the third and fourth between Doohan. Look at the back of the Yamaha chattering again under brakes. And, and uh, Campbell's gone off. Well, he must have been having some sort of brake problem. We saw him cleaning them up under brakes at the end of the back straight. He hasn't been doing it this heat. 
and there's an indication that it was a brake problem. I think it's safe to say this is the hardest circuit in Australia on brakes for any racing device. 55 odd second lap for these guys and three big, big stops on the brakes and Campbell rejoins proceedings. Um, the brakes don't get a rest. The problem is they build up an enormous amount of heat twice at the end of these big long straights and even in this spot here you're having a big lunge at the brakes and three big applications in 55 odd seconds is more than most of them can take, particularly of course with the cars. But Maladin at the moment doing it very well. Once again. Gap now nearly four seconds and James Knight in second place. No pressure now on Scott Doohan, so he's probably going to be fairly comfortable in his position at the moment. He had a reasonable margin. Malcolm Campbell went off at the end of the main straight on the previous lap. Actually, I think Doohan's getting a little closer to the back of night now, so this yep. battle is certainly not over. But look at that gap back to Troy Corsa. Takes a look behind him and sees that Campbell has disappeared, so he's got no pressure on him as they go up the straight again. But James Knight in his sights. Kawasaki's dominating this heat two of round two of the Shell Superbike Series. Campbell dropped back to position nine after that braking failure at the end of the straight. So he's got a lot of work to do to work back up here. And as we take race cam again, Eastern Creek race cam aboard Duan's Yamaha as he back through the gears, hard on the brakes as he approaches the main straight. Cranks the bike over. Last lap. As a quick glance. Look at the way the tops of the forks stress around. I mean, uh, these things are amazing, aren't they? Just fabulous pictures, tremendous stuff from our race cam team. Matthew Malad in the lead again, his customary position. 20-year-old kid with a enormous amount of potential, a lot of ability, and as his Kawasaki team manager Peter Doyle says, by far from the amount of experience the guys had the best thing to come out of Australia in superbikes. Interesting, you know, the combination of the superbikes with the touring cars and some of the other support events here today, I think the number of years they've been coming to Simmons Plains, this is the biggest crowd I've ever seen, and a lot of people will be enjoying this fabulous superbike racing. I think it's credit to the organisers to put the two cards together. So, out of the left-hander for the last time, Maladin pops a little wheelie and victorious in Heat 2, Round 2 of the Shell Oil Superbike Championship. Healthy margin back to James Knight. Third place goes to Scotty Doohan. And that'll be a long way gap. And there he is. How do they stop the this crowd. bloke? How, how do they do it? <laughs> I bet they're all scratching their heads and wondering that he's making it look so, so easy. Well, disappointment for him in the first heat last week at Sandown with an engine problem, but he's really stomping his signature all over this. Shell Race Score confirms that Maladin is the winner from James Knight, his teammate. Third place goes to Scotty Doohan. Fourth, his teammate, Troy Corsa. And fifth, the first of the Hondas was Chris Hill. And we're back after the break with more motor racing action. The Germans like to be in the forefront of technology. Their big high-tech cars are built to carry powerful men in the back, flat out between cities. When the powerful man pulls off to refuel, he wants his powerful man's snack of cream cake with extra cream, the famous Schmalzkücher with extra schmaltz, to have been whipped by lasers. In a country where two out of every three children are born with a PhD in electronics, high tech is a way of life. So it's no wonder their telephone system is being replaced with new high tech optical fiber. The Germans realize that optical fiber delivers the clearest sound quality. What they don't realize is that Telecom already uses optical fiber to link the capital cities of Australia. Willkommen! Telecom! Telecom! Australian for so much better. Welcome back to Simmons Plains, just a section of the rather huge crowd to turn out today for round three of the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship as the cars take off on their warm-up lap. Should be quite an interesting contest, keeping in mind uh, the majority of the drivers out there are still running on the tyres that they competed in on heat one earlier today. Here's the way they'll line up Glenn Seaton, the Peter Jackson Sierra and Dick Johnson alongside. Then Mark Scaife in the Winfield Nissan GTR from four. Tony Longhurst, keep an eye on him. From five, it's Jim Richards in the Winfield Nissan 5734. From six, number four, Mark Gibbs, the GIO Nissan GTR. From seven, number 20, Alan Jones, the Benson and Hedges BMW. From eight, at seven, Neil Crompton, the Mobile One Commodore. 
from nine, Paul Morris in the B&H BMW, and rounding out the 10, car number 86, Stephen Bell in the Starion. Only a few seconds away from the start of the second heat, the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship from Simmons Plains. The two Sierras on the front row. Off the start, the two Nissans get away beautifully. And it's a poor drag as they go to the first turn. The BMW got away, and it's going to be uh, Glenn Seaton on the inside and Dick Johnson the outside. Now, Johnson's got to get across and tuck in behind Seaton. Look at Longhurst going right around them, and he'll uh, pay the penalty as far as horsepower is concerned on the exit to that turn. But it'll be Seaton looking for two out of two as he comes down to the right-hand kink, and he'll lead the field as they start to build up to full-on speed. Seaton opens it up to two car lengths over Johnson. Then you've got the little bimmer up on the inside of Mark Scaife. Fascinating this. And, of course, Neil Crompton in there as well, and Peter Brock starting from the back of the field with a 10-second penalty. Look at Crompton <laughs> pushing his way through the pack there. Longhurst by way of his excellent start in the, in the finish, uh, sorry, in the first heat. Starting fourth on the grid, and he's been pushed back in the power race up the back straight for the first time. But there's Crompton up there in fourth position. That's a great start from him. They come across under the line. One lap down, still a lot to go. Glenn Seaton in the 30 car leads from Johnson. Mark Scaife is the next one, Crompton, and then Wayne Park also pulling out of the draft as they come down to the hairpin. And the little bimmer, Alan Moffat, looking pretty good at this stage as he comes up on the inside of Crompton. And doing nicely there, very, very nicely. And he'd do a lot more with uh, a few more ponies under the bonnet, but that's not to be for that vehicle. Glenn Seaton got a nice, nice start and a nice protected line into the hairpin. And he's holding the gap uh, to Johnson in just about the same proportion as he did in the first heat. By I think he's really feeling comfortable with this race. Johnson not in a really what you'd call pressing position. In fact, he's going to have to start worrying about what that Winfield Nissan's going to do to him in a, in a couple of more laps. Very close indeed. And here we have our man Crompton looking very good in the Mobile One Commodore. Well, coming up on the inside of Dick Johnson is Mark Scaife again. Crompton is the next one through. There's Glenn Seaton getting away in the Peter Jackson Sierra. And now watch the acceleration here, the exit to this turn. Mark Scaife dives in, pulls back on the inside. Now watch the horsepower, four-wheel drive. No advantage, huh? No, not much. But well, watch Johnson now with horsepower. And hasn't it got some horsepower? Johnson leaves Scaife behind as they have the back straight into the loop for the first time. The Ford not lacking in front. But look at Crompton. This is a great run from Neils on Wheels. Hasn't been happy with the car all the weekend. He wasn't happy with the handling in the first heat. It's his first time at Simmons Plains. And he's really enjoying himself in this second heat up in fourth place. And this is good stuff. And there's plenty happening even back behind this group as uh, Mark Scaife works to the outside. He's trying to get a line here on Johnson. Uh, Scaife's getting aggravated now, Michael, you can see he's, he's bound. When you see the car wobbling like that, he's pushing it to the limit. He's, he's really getting frustrated by uh, Dick's position here. Dick taking all the lines he should to, uh, to protect his line of uh, attack. But here we have the Winfield Nissan coming up on the outside. It's not going to do him a lot of good. Little under breaks. He's taken the dive. OK, he'll go through. He picks the inside rear wheel up on the curb on the exit. See what Johnson's got left with a bit of horsepower. And Crompton closes up as well. The GI on this end pulling out of the draft. And right behind Crompton is Wayne Park, who is having quite a day here. Pl held a play. And Colin Bond is coming through the field like a house on fire. Bond is up to sixth place. We'll catch sight of him shortly. There's Park closing as we take the Dunlop race cam as Dick Johnson trails Mark Scaife at this stage of the race. They're both trailing uh, Glenn Seaton and the Peter Jackson Sierra. Tell you what, Colin Bond will be a man to watch here. He didn't start in the first heat by way of that engine problem. And don't forget his tyres are going to be 26 laps fresher than everyone else in the field. And the Caltex car has proved it's very quick this weekend. So Bondy will be a real charger. And here he comes moving up on the back of Crompton in these opening laps of the race. And it's quite obvious that the Winfield strategy has been exactly the same. Save everything, save uh, Saturday, save Sunday morning don't get involved in the peter jackson dash and we have mark scaife now absolutely blasting away from dick johnson who is having to run at a pace that only he knows best to do with the condition of his tires meanwhile crompton is giving it everything he's sneaked off from the outside of johnson under brakes there he's got bond all over his back bumper and then wayne park behind him so it's a fierce four car battle here crompton struggling with the big 1300 kilogram commodore amongst these super lightweight forwards Seaton now leading by three seconds while this scrapping goes on. Well, this is good stuff. It's, it's obvious. Stuff. 
Dick Johnson's not in this race, not where he'd like to be. He's holding this uh, brigade up now, and it uh, looks like a, a possibility of getting nailed one by one quite uh, seriously here. They get nailed either one by one, or they'll all get him at one hit, because Dick's trying to uh, just hold it off. Crompton closes it up, and look at Bond. He pulls out of the draft, goes the inside, and Wayne Park is there too. Look at this from uh, Colin Bott as he comes floating up on the outside of Crompton. It all gets a bit wobbly. Crompton right up on the back of Dick, but Crompton's going to be in a good position here out of this corner because Bond has been snookered by oh. Dick. Oh, it gives him a out hand. Of a <laughs> There's plenty of body contact You taught him well, Al. Yeah, Colin wants to uh, make up for it. Well, that's what you can do when you have the confidence with the tyres and let's let's be kind to the others. He's uh, He's got a brand new fresh car here, fresh engine and fresh tyres. So he can uh, thrash it around the corners much more confidently. Dick is uh, struggling around on a set that he's already given pretty much uh, a serve of curry in the first heat. But I think Neil's doing extremely well here. Yeah. We must compliment him. I get the feeling that Dick may be holding him up, certainly in some sections of the circuit. Well, I'll tell you what, I, in reading this one, I think you find that uh, the next uh, maybe five or six laps, you're going to see Bond make an absolute charge at Mark Scaife. They come off the Dunlop Ridge area. That's Alan Jones going through. There's Johnson. Right behind him, Neil Crompton. Up on the inside comes Wayne Park in the second of the PJ oh. cars. Come on, Dick, he said. <laughs> yeah. Get on with it. Gives him a serve. There's plenty of glass. No. Oh, oh, flying it. everywhere. Well, Johnson's been pushed back three positions there. So Crompton can play rough too. And he certainly shows up there. Well, I don't think that was deliberate. I think that maybe he might have had a little... He, he may not have been able to stop that no. Commodore. Although that looked like pretty pretty good aggressive driving to me. I think Dick definitely was off the pace there. And Neil said, look, I want to stay in this race. Either way, it's certainly entertaining here's a couple of young blokes Wayne Park the 28 year old from Queensland taking on Crompton these young guys when they get a chance to drive these 500 horsepower cars certainly have a lot of fun they're very aggressive and they don't mind leaning on each other's panels one little bit in behind there the BMW 2 looking very strong in heat 2 as we suspected they come up towards the Dunlop Bridge again look at Longhurst hanging onto the back of these guys out of the corner he's getting a butte toe out of there he loses them down through the back sweep as Park now makes a big run on Crompton. Yeah, where there's wants. nowhere to go here, Wayne, let me tell you. There's nothing wrong with the Commodore brakes. Unless he can turn back inside of him. And the Holden <laughs> may be able to hold him there just for a second or two. And look at this gaggle of cars behind them. The two Nissans, Dick Johnson and the other Alan Jones BMW locked in behind there. This is a terrific race. Well, Wayne Park finally by Neil Crompton. A little bit of surge up the back straight through the kick nicely. He'll want to guard this corner to the left. Crompton not really going to challenge him. Nicely controlled through here. Wayne Park pulling it up on the approach to the back of the pits. The mobile Commodore staying in touch, but uh, Tony Longhurst is starting to come into this picture. His tyres, there's yep. a little power oversteer. I noticed Wayne it, going down the back straight last time too, Alan. The car was starting to switch around at the back, and that was on a full power and full speed. So I say his tyres are starting to head south. Crompton will be able to see that, and he'll certainly keep him honest to try and get those tyres worn down on the back of Park's car. Well, he, he's facing the same problem. Yeah. Here's a fairly second hand after a fairly torrid opening heap this morning. There's Johnson. Jimmy Richards making one of the few passes he's made today. In the meantime... Glenn Seaton opens it up. Johnson slipping further and further back through the field. This engine change hasn't done him any good, obviously. Uh, not as competitive as it was this morning, so Dick's struggling. I'll tell you, one guy who is making up a lot of ground is uh, Colin Bond. We're keeping check on him. And here he is. There's Mark Scaife running in second, and here comes Bondi in the Caltech CXT Sierra. That'll give Mike Brown and all the Caltech boys some heart. Colin campaigns in all the touring car rounds. They had a bit of problem this morning losing a motor after doing so well here over the past couple of days. But boy, he's like jumping Jack Flash. He's coming through the field here and he's just picked Scaife up. And I'd say he's probably picked up two or three hundred metres in the last three laps. The fundamental change with the Caltex team this year has been that they've discovered this uh, major overheating problem they've had with the engine. That's been playing, uh, mucking around with the engine management system. They finally cured the overheating problem and all of a sudden bot has got a very competitive race car in his hands. As you can see, here he goes outside Scape as they head under brakes. The GTR is very strong in the braking department. And Bond going deeper and deeper, he's done it easily. The big thing now, Alan, is that Bondy could actually be the series spoiler for today. Seaton really, after losing points at Sandown last weekend where he had a terrible time, Bondy hasn't run the first heat. 
uh, and if he gets Seaton, he's going to cost Seaton some points here today, and Seaton really did need those uh, 30 series points at the end of the afternoon. Yeah, and John Bowes kissed goodbye his fine run last weekend at Sandown, so certainly the points will uh, gel up. Well, John Bowes currently third in the uh, championship chase before they came to Simmons Plains, and Seaton is sixth, so Glenn will be uh, clutching at every point he can get, and uh, as Mike said, if Bond cleans him up, that's going to push him a long way down through the title chase, so it's got to be a real ding-dong battle when he gets up here. Meanwhile, back in the picture there, you can see Park still struggling along. And I think Longhurst just took Crompton, so he'll struggle along with those tyres as best he could, but I'd say they'll be on the way. Looking pretty tired anyway at this stage, but he's fighting back. Yeah, he's having a great run, and so too is uh, young Wayne Park. I know we put a couple of wraps on him earlier today. Let's check them out for you on the Shell Race score. Glenn Seaton leads in the Peter Jackson Sierra from Colin Bond and the Caltex machine. Third is Mike Mark Scaife in the Winfield Nissan, followed by Wayne Park and Neil Crompton. Rounds out the top five back at Simmons in just a moment. The action continues at Simmons Plains Raceway with race two of round three, the Shell Australian Touring Car Championship. Back in the pack, Neil Crompton, car number five, and Tony Longhurst continue their fascinating scrap here. This is the battle for fifth and sixth. Crompton still holds on to fifth place, but <laughs> Longhurst giving him plenty coming out of the loop. Yes, he'll be trying to stay right on the bumper bar of that Commodore now and not doing a bad job when you consider you know, flashing his lights a little bit unhappy about something. It's interesting. Considers uh, Neil to be doing something unsporting. I don't think that that's probably justified at this stage of the game. When you're door handle to door handle, you can uh, flash your lights at somebody, but Tony's not that close yet. He's got to be right on the bumper bar of that Commodore before he can possibly pull out of the slingshot and nail him under brakes. Here's Richards as we take the Nissan race cam, moving up uh, here on the right behind Dick Johnson. Johnson wobbling around just a little bit, but look at the uh, acceleration as he goes beneath the Dunlop Bridge and now down the short chute to the hairpin turn. And we've been inside Jim a, with Jim a couple of times today. Motor really doesn't seem to be doing uh, a lot of revving. They're not screaming at a time, no. mate. I don't Listen to know this. how they've uh, geared it, but uh, up through the gears very, very quickly. Uh, almost moseying. Dick, Dick's in position seven, Scaife's in eighth, and coming up behind them is uh, Alan Jones in the second of the BMW's BNA, BNA in ninth. So Dick's still hanging on there. And Crompton is also hanging on in front of him for Longhurst. Longhurst is going to give him plenty around the back of this circuit. I was saying earlier today that the BMW is as fast as anyone around this back section of the track through the tight, twisty turns. And Longhurst had, uh, Crompton has his work cut out for him, keeping Longhurst out. Longhurst he's taking a chance him. here, he's taking a chance here, getting sideways, uh, oh, on the inside, couldn't do it. Neil's doing the right thing, he looks like he's keeping that car as straight as possible to try and conserve those tyres, he's got to squeeze every ounce of life out of them that he can, and keep Longhurst at bay as well, so it should be an absorbing dice. Well, he's in some good company here, and here comes Longhurst down the inside. See Neil just covering his ground there. Well, it's every doing man exactly for himself. What he's he should perfect, be doing. perfectly legitimate. Yeah, no, he's doing exactly what he should be. And Tony picked up a little bit on the inside there. Now he's going to try and drag him down. And if he can stay parallel with him along the straights, he'll be lined up on the left lane for the left-hander at the end of the straight. But no, can't hold off the Global Commodore in a straight line. Well, here he comes under brakes. This will be a mad last-minute uh, charge at the turn. Not enough space to do it in. So Crompton still continues to lead that BMW. They're backing up behind these two with probably uh, two or three car lengths between them. Bond still chasing after the race leader, Glenn Seaton. We're keeping an eye on that for you. It's still out to about four or five car lengths at the moment. Coming up underneath the Dunlop Bridge, and here comes Jim Richards working to the outside, but Dick's already there, and Dick will stay to the inside as they go up to the left-hander and actually gets away from uh, Jim. Now the brakes oh. as Longhurst, I think the moment of truth and went just a little bit wide there to let Crompton know that uh, he had taken charge of that corner. He just cost Crompton a little bit of time there, couldn't quite get on. He's having another go at him, but that was a very nice strategic move by Tony Longhurst. Just ever so subtle. It was. A bit further back there, behind that battle is Johnson and Richards. Johnson's doing a remarkable job to hold Richards off up till now, but Jim sneaks through. Dick's struggling along after that engine change. His tyres will probably be a bit tired too, I'd say. Actually, the gap between uh, Glenn Seaton and uh, Colin Bond fairly constant as uh, Johnson finds himself in the wars here with Mark Gibbs uh, and Bob Forbes' GIO uh, Nissan and Alan Jones making life unbearable for the pair of them. 
<laughs> Here's Jonesy sitting in the draft. He hasn't got enough uh, grunt to be able to pull out and try and pass them. Dick's trying to protect the inside lane. Forbes goes the outside. Now, if, if Alan Jones is up smartly, he might get the inside of the pair of them here. But he'll pay the penalty with prize money. They're three wide as they come out of that turn. You couldn't complain about the quality of racing here today at Simmons Plains. It has been absolutely first class. Jones taps into the draft behind Johnson. Johnson's car may not be doing. It's running too strongly, but it's certainly quicker down the straight than the BMW, so it's a good place to be. Oh, here comes Alan Jones. He's going to oh. use his brakes to best avail. Yes, he's, he's got him by him. Johnson. And nicely now the GIO car will be a little bit wider. By the, the, that I mean give him a little bit more uh, wind resistance and uh, Tony L. Alan Johns rather will uh, have an opportunity to get a better slipstream off that GIO car. So now Crompton's got uh, the Jim Richards on his back as they come down toward the hairpin another time. Longhurst has opened a little gap on the Commodore. Crompton doing a good job in the mobile car this year. I think he was about two tenths off Brock in qualifying at Amaru and uh, certainly at Sandown he was matching Brock's pace. So. He's doing a good job with the Brock BMW uh, mobile team. I Brock think you'll is... find now on this lap, Mark, that uh, Jim's going to be close enough to be in that slipstream and going to give Neil something to think about at the end of the straight. Meanwhile, his teammate Peter Brock is running second last in the race, so he's struggling in the other car. A big close-up under brakes by Jim Richards. Able to keep his momentum wound up there. He's in a position now where the Commodore is actually holding him up in that little short straight on the approach to the back of the pits but uh, Crompton not giving way. He'll place his car exactly where he wants to. There's only one way to do it around that left-hander in front of the pits. But Jim Richards very close now. He may have another stab under brakes going into the hairpin. He's certainly right on that Commodore. I do believe there was a slight little sporting gesture there from Neil to yeah. say, I can't do it. Grab me on the inside. And that's uh, true professionalism. A fellow did his job for many, many laps, held him off to the best of his abilities, but knew on that particular occasion his Commodore wasn't going to pull up. He just gave a quiet, quiet nod to Jim, and uh, Richards took advantage of it. Glenn Seaton will be praying to see a two plus something. He'll know the countdown, how many laps he's got, mental arithmetic, and how much he can perhaps punish those Bridgestones on the last few laps. He'll know what he's done to them, and bear in mind, he started yesterday afternoon on this set of tires. He had to qualify, did a good job, had equal time with Colin Bond to take third on the grid, ran the dash this morning. Three laps to go in the race. Alan, you've been in this situation many times. What's going through your mind when you're just trying to defend your lead and the guy behind you is so close? Well, at this stage of the game, I used to push the rearview mirror up so I couldn't see him and literally only kept in my rhythm and stayed on that gap and let the arithmetic work for itself. It's terribly, uh, terribly nervy when you can see the other uh, fellow and uh, what will be running through Glenn's mind at the moment is, you know, just give me another no mistake. Just like that golfer, if we can relate to a golf shot, up on, nice chip, take it easy, not get rattled. Here's uh, the challenge for seventh position. Crompton running in seventh. Mark Gibbs has caught him up in the GIO GTR. Well, he's got him for the last couple of laps, but it, there's nothing he can do about it. He gets fairly close at the end of the uh, sweeper. And he sits in Crompton's draft as they work the right-hand kink. But the Holden gets away just a tad through that corner. And the Holden, if anything, uh, Peter Brock may have been having problems with his brakes, but uh, Crompton's done fairly well today. Been fairly economical, I believe, in the seven car. May have chosen the right pads, and maybe Peter went the wrong way. Well, certainly brake pad selection is in the driver's hands, and uh, it is a crucial aspect. Uh, most of these fellows running on uh, Ferrodo uh, pads, but there are a variety of compounds, just like the tires, and uh, this is what practice is all about, and the uh, driver is responsible for getting the package that will do the job. Anybody can look good for a couple of laps in practice, but the objective is the two heats and coming out on top at the end of the day. Now, Mark Gibbs tries to set it up to slingshot back on the inside, the exit to that turn, but can't do anything about that. So this midfield dice between uh, the Holden and, of course, the GIO Nissan GTR continues. It'll go all the way to the flag, and I think Glenn Seaton probably will because he's coming in to take the one-lap-to-go signal now. He'll go beneath the Dunlop Bridge. 
the gap down to probably about two seconds now with Colin Bond and a similar gap back to Mark Scaife in the Nissan running in third. Fourth, I would think uh, Wayne Park in the number 35, Peter Jackson Nissan. And next on the queue would be Jim Richards in the one car, Tony Longhurst and Neil Crompton with Bob Forbes still trying to tackle him. They're on their last lap, heading down to the sweeper. There's the gap, first, second and third. A fairly close finish coming up to today's second race at round three of the Shell Australian Championship. Glenn Seaton opens the gap up just a little bit more as he comes down to Coca-Cola turn. Dabs it in here nicely. He knows he has the race one at this stage. And he's driven uh, a great uh, two races here today at, um, at Simmons Plains. The dust has been on the circuit up at that top end all day. They're coming down to the final series of heats and the Peter Jackson Ford Sierra of Glenn Seaton comes up with a double at round three today at Simmons Plains, Tasmania. He wins from Colin Bond's Caltech Sierra and third goes to Mark Scaife in the Nissan. Fourth going to Park and fifth to Jimmy Richards. Let's check them out for you on the race score. Seaton the winner. Colin Bond finishes in second spot. Great drive that. Third, Mark Scaife in the Winfield Nissan. Fourth, Wayne Park in the second of the PJ Sierras. And rounding out the five, Jimmy Richards. And we'll talk to the winners when we return. Well, the Sierras dominant at Sandin and dominant again at Simmons Plains. Dick Johnson in third position, Dick. Well done, but gee, had a few engine worries today, didn't you? Oh, we had a few engine problems and also, uh, you know, the tyres really never came back on after that first heat, so we were in trouble right from the start. And, you know, everything passed me, I suppose, everything except a kidney stone. Well done, better luck for the next round. Thanks. Mark Scaife in second place, well done, Mark. Thanks, Mark. The Nissan's once again struggling against the Sierras. They have, those regulations have really knocked you guys around, haven't they? Oh, they have, but, you know, the second race is a good race and uh, this sort of circuit, we knew that uh, the cars wouldn't be quite competitive enough there and, uh, you know, I think it's a good result for us, really. Yeah, well done, Scaife, great. In first position today, Glenn Seaton. Well done, Glenn. Great to yeah. see you back in form. The Peter Jackson car running extraordinarily well. Yeah, it's, it's actually running very well. I was, I was very surprised at how our form was today. I'm very, very happy. But uh, once we start to get to the, the circuits at the end of the, the rounds, we're going to find it fairly hard in the tight circuits. So these are the circuits that suited us. Well done, Glenn. Tom Smith from the Shell Company to make the presentation. A long overdue win, mate. Congratulations you, on behalf of Shell. Thank you very much. A lot of good action here at Simmons Plains today, and uh, we expect some more at Winton. So, progressive points after three rounds. Scaife the leader on 84, Richards on 72, Seaton on 66 now, and Dick Johnson 57. Seaton said they'll do a tough on the short tracks, I think Winton perhaps. Yes, certainly the GTR and the BMWs around that tight circuit will be dynamite, Mike. Well, if we have a race at Winton as good as the two heats today, well, there'll be no complaining from us. We sincerely hope that you've enjoyed all the action today from Simmons Plains. We look forward to your company on April 4 when we go motor racing at Winton Raceway. Goodbye until then. Well, thanks for watching, guys. If you like this video, please hit the like button, and if you haven't subscribed already, please do. And remember, Super 100 MPH is taking historic Australian motorsport to the world. Wow.